uh, I, I persisted uh, because I was I was really engaged by it seemed to be the grandeur uh, of India's effort to make this historic turn to equality in a society of legendary hierarchy. And then I put the for unrelated reasons I put the project over. Now, uh, aside for uh, some years and returned to it in the late 1970s, uh, and again, few would have predicted that those policies would become a prominent and intensely contested feature of Indian political life. I finished the book in the early 1980s, just after the Mundo Report came out. But the Mundo Report actually came out in 1980. It was, it was put on the shelf and languished there for 10 years. I mean, it was just one more dead report. And then, due to political circumstances at the end of the 80s, it suddenly uh, came back uh, from the political, from the policy backwaters into the mainstream. And reservations became a burning issue, literally, on the Indian political scene. Uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to do now is look back uh, from afar and, and from a, uh, over this long time gap um, and just say some things that, that might be relevant to, to readers of the book. Uh, and uh, I have a rather long uh, manuscript here, which I obviously I'm not going to read to you, but I, I'm, uh, uh, actually Sudarshan has a copy, and if there's any of you that would really like to, to see it and, and write me your impressions about it, uh, please bother him and he will give you a copy. Uh, so, uh, but let me just say these, you know, make a few remarks about these policies, and I want to get your your um, your re reaction, but but I think we have to say that the culture that frames and animates these policies has changed very dramatically. The, the Gandhian notions of simplicity and uplift that were very much in the air when these policies were formulated in the Constituent Assembly, those notions have faded. Uh, the consensus that accompanied the adoption of th these policies has been modified. The, the, because the original notion was that untouchability and tribal isolation and exploitation were a singular exception, that they were so different than, uh, than uh, everything else in Indian society that it that required a major, separate, but hopefully temporary departure from the norms of formal equality that were being brought in by the Constitution. And that sense of that these things are really different and distinct has, has definitely uh, faded uh, away. Uh, now, there's a heightened awareness of many kinds of inequality, gender, class, physical disability, sexual orientation, and in many quarters, there's a willingness to find some equivalence or at least commensurability with the disadvantage associated with, with a stigmatized dissent group. And I'm using that dissent group as a kind of general category to talk about the, the, uh, the, the uh, use of scheduled cash, scheduled tribe, OBC as, as categories. Okay. Uh, so you can think of this as a, as a diffusion or flattening out of the perception of desert that animated the original constitutional dispensation. What was seen as exceptional 
and transitional is now treated as an available tool to address the demands of many groups and seen more or less as a sort of permanent feature of the, of the legal, political landscape. Uh, and uh, so as the programs have expanded and more different groups of potential beneficiaries have been brought in, at the same time, the programs have expanded, but actually, uh, the, for example, the number of government jobs that's being distributed by such programs uh, after rising into the 1980s is now shrinking and has shrunk, and, and yet the groups are, are, uh, are bigger. So back in, uh, I, I should have used the PowerPoint, but anyway, you'll have to visualize these numbers. Uh, back in 1981, when there were 156 million SCs and STs, uh, there were, if you took the entire central government job list, there were about 22 jobs for every thousand SCs and STs. But what's, ha and remember, and they get basically 20% of the new intake. Now remember, the new intake is about 1 25th the service, assuming people stay there, there for 25 years. Uh, so 1 25th means you are replacing 4% of the people and 15% or I'm sorry, 22% of that. So let's say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my numbers, but basically you could see it's a, it's, it's a really tiny portion of the service uh, of these jobs that's being given to people. Uh, 22 for every thousand people uh, each year. Uh, or, or rather, 22% of 22, which is four or five percent, uh, four or five jobs for every thousand people. Okay, and that that was 1981. By 2011, th there were less than half as many jobs government jobs per thousand people, with the increase of population much greater than the increase of in government jobs. So now there are only nine, or, or what do we say, 22% of time, two, right? two government jobs for every thousand SCs and STs uh, every 15 years, or every 25 years. I'm, I'm getting lost myself, but you can see, my point is that that uh, this is a shrinking a shrinking pool of of, um, of benefits that are being given to this ever larger larger group. Uh, so whatever this program is, it cannot be. Uh, and when when somebody in these groups gets a job, you can think it's not only the individual that that flourishes, but maybe a large extended family. So maybe there's a, there's a multiplier effect. And when one a person gets a, even a class, class four, what do they call it, class D now, job, maybe 10 people or 20 people are, are given some, a, a leg up. Uh, but even so, you can see it's a very small fraction of the targeted group. Uh, and so this can hardly be a program of general uplift. And my sense is that actually, the, at least nowadays, the numbers uh, affected by general programs like the midday meal program, the uh, 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 100 days of work a year, what's that called? The guaranteed employment program. 
and Narega and, and so on, and, and these general programs, and the 25%, the uh, education one, what's it called? The, what? Yeah, the right to education with the 25% uh, that private schools have to give, that those programs probably affect a much larger number of SCs and STs than do the special programs for SCs and STs. But I don't think anybody has actually traced that out, but uh, you should do that if you're looking for a topic, a great topic. Uh, anyway, so the, the relative uh, presence of these special programs, it seems to me, has actually, even though the number of programs, the number of groups that are supposed to be included in them has increased, they're really a smaller portion of what's going on than they, than they were before. Um, and uh, so the beneficiary, the number of groups, the number of people in those groups has grown, but the resources distributed by these programs have not grown correspondingly. Uh, so the question is whether they, these, this has been offset by inclusion in these general programs for the disadvantaged. Uh, I want to put that question aside and look specifically at these special programs for Chagotas and, and tribes. Uh, it's been, they've been in place now for 60 years and there's been a lot of adjudication going to the courts and I'm a lawyer so that's really how I got into this, looking at what the courts were doing. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, in this paper I try to, to uh, talk about what's happened to the, now, now the courts, as, and, and here it's really, these cases all go to the high courts and the Supreme Court. And, and I guess some of them actually go through government uh, tribunals having to do with, with uh, government service. But for the moment, focusing on the high courts and particularly the Supreme Court, because uh, to give you a sense of the change in scale, which is so dramatic, when I wrote this book in 19, the early 80s, so these, these um, policies have been in place for 30 years. And in 30 years, there were about 110 cases on all aspects of this, on government jobs, on reservations in, in uh, medical schools, in engineering schools, in uh, the odd case of some other government program, because almost all the cases were about these reservations. Uh, on, yeah, so 110 cases getting into the higher courts over 30 some years, so four cases a year. Today, there are probably 110 cases a month. So if we go from 30 years to a month, it gives you a sense of the enormous change in scale of this thing. So I, I knew those 110 cases in a way that I obviously don't know the thousands that, that flow out now. And there's been a curious change in the courts too, particularly the Supreme Court. Because in those, when the Supreme Court started out, it was uh, I think eight judges to start with. And in most cases, uh, a large portion of those judges sat. Sometimes five, sometimes seven, always at least three. And as you, so you can see, that was a significant chunk of the court. Now, there are, I think, 31, I may be behind, but 31 judges on the Supreme Court. And because of the, the, their openness to all kinds of business, uh, they sit, for the most part, in benches of two. So you have major decisions being made basically by one fifteenth, what's that, seven percent or something of the court. 
uh, and different benches and deciding all, the, all these issues. Uh, in theory, of course, they have, they're supposed to say, oh, if, we're, if we disagree with an earlier two judge bends, we should tell the Chief Justice and try and bump this up to a three judge or bigger bench, but that's rarely, rarely done. So there's a lot more uh, uh, variety and, and at least differences of, of nuance in, in these opinions um, and uh, that, than, there, than there was then. Uh, but it also means that anybody who has a, a grievance or a, and can afford it can push their way and get a response from the Supreme Court because there's just a lot more uh, possibility of that with these 15 courts sitting. Uh, so it, 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 there's a kind of uh, disarray and, and uh, variance that introduced into the system by the changes in the court, quite apart from the changes in these policies coming into the courts. But let me just mention one policy as an example of, of uh, this. Suppose we say, here's a group that we think is definitely deserving of some special treatment. And we say, okay, this group is 20% of the population. Now, suppose we say, okay, they're 20%, and if we look at the figures now, they're only actually winning 5% of these university places on, on merit. And we can question, I think we, at least the first time we use it, we ought to put merit in quotation marks. You know, because the whole question of just how accurately these tests are devised to select the people that are really best for this particular selection. That's a, a general question that seems to me to run through all these selections, and it's a valid one, and so forth. But I don't think that means we should say, well, you know, merit doesn't count, but I think it's a real question of are we, how accurately have we actually measured merit. Okay, put that aside. These people are this group, group X, that we're going to give some benefits to, they get 5% on merit, they're 20% of the population. We'd like to, uh, um, to see more of them in, in the selection. Uh, so they have a reservation of 20%, 5% they don't merit. Now what do we do? We take the, 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 the list, performance of people on this test, whatever it is, and we say, well, they got this reservation of 20, they got five. Now what happens? Do they get 15 more, which is what I call treating the reservation as a guaranteed minimum. We say, we bring them up to 20. Or we say, wait, whatever they got, that's wonderful, that shows great great achievement on the part of these few that made the five that made it on merit. And we'll leave them aside. We'll say they have merit seats, and now we give 20 more. That's what I call the over and above uh, kind of reservation. Now, at the very beginning, uh, by which I mean the early years after the Constitution came in force, in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, some courts encountered this, and uh, but not, you know, in those days, frankly, very few people in these protected groups ever got, made it onto the merit list. They were, you know, really quite <coughs> far behind education. Uh, but over the years, more and more uh, people in the, those protected groups did get places on merit, so this question really became a real question. And the Supreme Court, for the most part, without, I think, ever fully explaining why, 
has basically said, yeah, whatever they get is fine, and we give the reservations over and above that amount. Uh, now, uh, I, was, I was kind of puzzled by that, uh, although I must say that in talking to a number of groups, uh, uh, my surprise <laughs> wasn't shared by, by most of the people I talked to. They said, of course, that's the way it should work. You should give them these places over and above. And I'm, I'm, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, as I say, I, I thought this, I was kind of surprised by this. I'm sort of very curious. Uh, because it's, a, it's very consequential in terms of just the amount, uh, particularly as the groups improve their performance, it can be very consequential as to the amount of places that are, that are actually diverted by the reservation. Uh, so uh, I, I'd be curious when, when we, what you, what you think. Now, you can say these guaranteed minimum reservations, uh, well, they have some advantage. Guaranteed minimum means they get five and we give them another, uh, I can't remember the number. We, we give them a, uh, the rest of the reserve number, 15, and we, but we don't give them the full 20. That's a guaranteed minimum. Uh, now, one problem with the guaranteed minimum is it can lead to an exaggerated public estimation of how much uh, affirmative action there is. For example, at the point where this group is actually given 15% on merit and only 5% uh, additional seats, uh, it looks like they're getting 20%, even though they may be getting 5%. So that's a problem. Uh, and, uh, and actually, it's a... Uh, um, secondly, the, the administration of a guaranteed minimum means everybody in the competition has to be assigned a group identity. You can't say... Um, um, not, you know, I don't want to identify myself, uh, I want to move past this, as some people do and would be willing to, to, to do that, but you can't let people do that if you're going to administer a guaranteed minimum. Uh, but there's some advantages also. A guaranteed minimum basically says we give you as much reservation as as you have backwardness. That is, the more the members of the backward group were able to compete on merit, the less preference they receive uh, as a result of the reservation of a given size. Uh, so as the performance of the members of the backward group improves and they're able to compete on merit, the net diversion of places uh, delivered by the reservation will decrease correspondingly. Uh, now, the question is, is that a good thing? Uh, I thought, uh, I must confess, when I wrote it, I thought that was unequivocally a good thing. But I encountered so many people, and, and people of, uh, of intelligent people of goodwill, who said, no, no, we, we like the fact that, that uh, if people start making it on merit, we add even more through the reservation. So I'm sort of curious how you guys feel about this and, and, and why. Uh, um, so, as I said, there's, there's a great difference in these, in these uh, two reservation devices. And what I'm going to do, since I, I didn't equip myself with a, with a uh, thing, is I'm going to pass these around and you can see, those of you who have very good eyesight will see even when I hold them up. This is what, this is what an over and above reservation looks like as the performance of the, the group increases, they still get this whole set of additional places. Whereas the guaranteed minimum, when their performance is quite negligible at the beginning, they get a big a boost, but the, 
as their performance increases, the boost decreases as well, uh, correspondingly. So I'll pass these around. You can please pass them back, the only copy I have. Uh, OK, so the question is, uh, you know, theory could work either way. And the question is, uh, as I say, what surprised me is that the Supreme Court, which for the most part, for the most part, has been basically treating all reservations as if they're over and above. OK. Uh, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this in a minute. But I'll tell you about another, another important distinction. One of the important things that's happened is a great proliferation in the use of the reservation device. Uh, and you can, there's reservations for more of these dissent groups, but there are also reservations for women, for the disabled, and for others whose life experience or situation is thought to make them especially deprived or deserving. Uh, so we can visualize reservations for SCs, STs, OBCs that's sort of lying on the same dimension. They're sort of parallel to one another. Uh, there may be a little fuzziness sometime about the boundaries, uh, but the populations in those categories don't overlap uh, or duplicate one another. So we can have these reservations for these parallel groups, and they have simple additive properties, a 30% reservation for OPCs and a 10% reservation for SCs adds up to 40%. Okay. Uh, but uh, other categories of beneficiaries, like women, the disabled, ex-service persons, and so forth, those are not parallel to these. Though they're orthogonal. They're at right angles. They cut across these. Uh, and they intersect with them, and so and with the re the residual so-called general category. So what happens when we get reservations in these two dimensions uh, that the Supreme Court has actually recognized and given a name to? They call them they call the dissent group reservations. That's dissent groups, SCST or BC. They call those vertical reservations, and they've called the reservations for women, uh, the disabled, I think, not clear what they're, but certainly for women, they've called this horizontal reservations. And they recognize that, yes, they intersect. Uh, so what happens uh, now? Uh, I'll just tell you this one case in which there's both kinds of reservations. There were 15% for SCs, 21% for STs. I don't know where that was. It, it must have been someplace with a lot of STs. 14% uh, for OBCs, 30% for women candidates, 3% for Freedom Fighter Cutter, and 3% for SANIC Cutter. SANIC, I gather, was a system of government supported selective schools is to prepare deserving students to qualify as officers in military service. Okay, so the total of 86% reservations uh, and uh, the, the appointing authority uh, proceeded to set aside uh, 13 of the 42 open seats for women candidates it then filled the remaining 29 open seats in the order of merit, which ended up including 12 <coughs> more women who had scored among the top candidates, but were, had not been counted against the reservation for women. So the court said, oh, no, no, this is unconstitutional because they've exceeded the 50% quota. And that's another thing. But they said this 50% limit uh, is only applies to reservations for the dissent groups, SC, ST, OBC. Uh, but, and for those dissent groups, the court says, we should use an over and above system. They get whatever, they get the 
full amount of reserved seats above and beyond uh, any that they get on merit. But, they said, when it comes to the horizontal resolutions, women in this case, who, they said, no, no, they just get a guaranteed minimum. Uh, if, if there's enough in the local merit selection, then the reservation's finished, we don't have to bother with it, and, and so on. So basically, the courts are saying we have over and above in this dimension and, and guaranteed minimum in this dimension. I, I, uh, I haven't tracked down, I'm sure there are probably other cases where they, where they try to, where, where they show us how they do this. So, yeah. Well, that's the normal thing. It's certainly in dissent group, that, you know, and you can say why, because, but it's a convention that if there's 12 percent uh, STs, say in a particular state, they'll give it a 12 percent reservation, even though they're dealing with a with a, a particular benefit that maybe only some small number, suppose it's, if we're talking about medical school admissions, which is something that requires a high initial uh, set of conditions on the part of the, the beneficiary, uh, clearly 12% of the people who have any likelihood of getting into medical school are not STs, and yet they will pitch the, the, the reservation at that level. That's, this is a convention which seems to have been in place and never questioned. However, uh, when it comes to women, uh, they don't say 50% or 46% or whatever the percentage is. They usually just say, well, we want to give these people a boost. Uh, we'll have a 10% or 20% reservation. So, so it's, it's funny. In terms of the dissent groups, and I'm, it, it, I'm glad you brought this point up. In terms of the dissent groups, it is a, I think, an almost unalterable convention that you give reservations at the, po at the percentage of the population that group, whether there's any relevance, really, in terms of the pool from which you're actually drawing applicants to, to medical school. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, that is not done with with women and the handicapped uh, and you know, things, other things like these uh, Sanix or whatever, you know, other little groups that they come up with, there they just uh, make up a number. And the, okay. So, uh, as I say, the, 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 one of the interesting things is, uh, as far as I know, has never really been considered is why this convention of using the, the population number. Now, it seemed to me if you were giving out some, some um, if you were giving out uh, preschool tutoring, population would be a pretty good measure of the people in this tribal group, et cetera, who need it. Well, on the other hand, uh, it's not, clear that if you're giving out medical school admissions, there's any correspondence, but nevertheless, that's, that's the, the sort of mindset here that we want to, to, uh, to at least appear generous in these things, and okay. uh, you, you can figure that out, I'm sure, better than I. Uh, anyway, so, so the, the courts, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about just how the, the horizontal, the horizontal guaranteed minimum uh, reservations and the vertical over and above reservations are to be meshed. Uh, and you could say, well, wait a minute. We've got two dimensions here say women on this dimension, descent groups on this dimension. How about the handicapped? They're not either, or, you know, so isn't that, that's really a third dimension. And 
course, it's hard to put on a sheet of paper, but you can begin to, to see that it's, it's really something that intersects with both of the others. And in the paper, I try to make a, to, to give a sense of what it would look like. So you get this, this very, uh, very detailed grid which the appointing authorities supposedly have, have to deal with. I, I've never seen them actually, uh, th that I haven't looked at all the cases, administered in, in three dimensions or recognized that there's more than two dimensions. But clearly, the things I've said about, about the vertical and horizontal would lead you to, to, to the notion that there's, that there's at least one more dimension in, in just in the groups that they're dealing with. Anyway, let me go back. So, um, with uh, and I, in the paper, I, I give some complicated examples. Uh, so you've got this tension on the one hand between guaranteed minimums over and above. And you have, then you have the complexity introduced by the multi-dimensional character of reservations. And then they come and say, but reservations can only be 50%. And the 50% rule, as I argue, you know, has a kind of shaky uh, history. And, and it's hard to figure out what it really means, given the, this tremendous complexity of reservations on several dimensions. Um, another kind of complexity that's in here is each of the, the when we talk about these descent groups, OBCs, SCs, STs, we know these are big uh, composite categories. There's lots of different groups with very different conditions and different histories in each of those groups. Uh, and we also know that there tends to be a kind of clustering that some of those groups, typically the more urban ones, the ones that have had a bit more opportunity for education and so forth, uh, so often the larger ones, because they're better organized, will, will uh, take a disproportionately large portion of the total reservations. Um, and if that bothers people, I said, OK. Uh, it's good the, these people are getting it, but the other groups are not getting any at all. And maybe we should, maybe we should subdivide the quota, create a sub classifications or compartments, we could call them, and uh, divide up things. And, and uh, although it is not, it is done in some states by dividing two levels, and I should say this is among the OBCs. They say the backward and the most backward, and, and they'll say half has to go to the most backward. Okay. Uh, Supreme Court has, has let that go. They, they've not been enthused by it, I should say. But when it comes to the SCs, they say, oh, no, no, you, SCs and SCs, you can't do that because SCs and STs are, are uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll read you <laughs> what they say, but maybe it will make sense to you. They, they say, uh, they say it can't do this because the presidential designation of the various groups of scheduled castes has transformed them into an indivisible single class. Well, obviously that's a fiction, uh, but the, the last court that looked at this says, yes, the very fact that a legal fiction has been created is itself suggestive of the fact that the legislature of a state cannot take any action which would be contrary to or inconsistent therewith. The very idea of placing different castes or tribes in a state as a conglomeration by way of a deeming definition clearly suggests they are not to be subdivided or subclassified. 
uh, I must say I find this obtuse and unpersuasive, but, but and I think uh, it's surprising that, that more uh, efforts haven't been made. But one of the, it really points to a very interesting thing. If you look at all this litigation, on the one side, you typically have people who are objecting to the, to the schemes, the, say, non-beneficiaries. On the other side, you have not the beneficiaries or their lawyers, you have the government. And the government lawyers have their, you know, the government has its own uh, tendency to be very pleased with its own policies and not to want to challenge or change them. So that in a curious way, the, the, the way this litigation works, the beneficiaries aren't there at all. Or they're being represented by the government which has its own, its own views and interests. So in this case, we never get, uh, the beneficiaries actually never get an opportunity to say, wait a minute, we think subdivision would be good. Although you can imagine that a lot of the beneficiaries, particularly from the groups that are, that are getting all the benefits now, would not be enthused about that and, and so on. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a kind of curious system in which, in which the beneficiaries are just not players. Uh, they just don't get into this litigation game at all, which is, a, a, I think, a weakness of, of the litigation. Uh, anyway, uh, as you can see, the, so the whole set of, of puzzles that the Supreme Court is, deals with, uh, I think, I'm gonna just take a couple minutes more. Uh, but, uh, as you say, for the most part, what we see is this, the courts dealing with what you might call high echelon benefits. That is, you can think of all the benefits of these various programs for SCs, STs, OBCs. And what I mean, if, if you look at a preschool enrichment program, that's a low echelon benefit. It doesn't, it applies to a wide section of the population. It requires very little in the way of matching resources or prior preparation to use it. Uh, and then there are many benefits like low-level clerk positions that are kind of in the middle. They require some prior attainments uh, that are available to fairly large sections of the population. But then we get things like medical school admissions, uh, which uh, require a great deal of prior attainment and are only really competed for by a small portion of the, of the beneficiary group. Uh, now, one thing to note is that high echelon benefits, medical school admissions, are cheap and easy to bestow. What does it take, what does it cost the state in terms of effort or resources and so forth to, to do that? Not much. But preschool enrichment programs, that costs a lot of money, it's hard to administer, it takes a, a huge amount of, of energy and effort to do that. So the very fact that something is what I call a high echelon benefit doesn't mean that it necessarily absorbs more state resources. In fact, most of the time I think it absorbs less than low echelon benefits. And what we see in the, all these programs is a tremendous bias, it seems to me, in favor of high echelon, very visible, programs, and of course it's the more abandoned sections within the beneficiary groups that are responsive to that and, and so forth. So there's almost, I, I wouldn't say, and, and I, 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 this is totally figurative, yeah, that there's a kind of collusion in some sense between the more advanced people in, the, in these uh, beneficiary groups and the government officials, because it's easier to give them things than to really dig deep and try to change the conditions in, 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 in poor busties and, and so on. Uh, so uh, my argument is that the low echelon schemes need to be reinforced by monitoring and assessment of their performance, but the courts rarely 
analyze the performance of lower echelon benefits. Uh, the judicial ascenda, uh, agenda is set by those who challenge affirmative action, uh, that is by the people who didn't get into medical school uh, or didn't get the government post, uh, and that reinforces the tendency for, the, for most tangible benefits to flow to a small section of the putative beneficiaries. I'm gonna stop there and hope that you have some, some thoughts about this. And, and let me just say, um, uh, you know, I have no problem with criticism or disagreement, so please, what do you think? <laughs>